Hey Internet, it's RJ. Welcome back. Thanks for tuning into the show today. Now today is Sunday, so you know what that means. We're going around the net with all the news you can use in the week that was in credit and finance. So on the docket for today, we have a few things. We'll first check in, which is probably the normal person headline of the week, and that was the credit rating agencies downgrading uh, some more regional banks and even some larger ones. So we'll go through that. We're checking in with a cyber uh, security research firm who actually took a look at the, the vast amount of points loyalty programs that are all run by one company to see just how safe your points are. And of course, we will touch on that American Express uh, Delta rumor where Amex could be, or Delta could be restricting access from those Amex cards to the beloved Sky Lounge. So of course, if that sounds interesting to you, go ahead, press the subscribe button, and let's get to work. Now, we will bat lead off. We will start with the credit rating agencies downgrading some of the banks. Now, this is probably, again, the, the, the headline that caught the most attention uh, you know, through the, throughout the week. So here we have three main credit rating agencies. You have Standard & Poor's, you have Fitch, and you have Moody's. Now, Fitch was in the news last week because they actually downgraded U.S. debt. So what they're doing when we say downgrade, they're basically rate, rating debt, right? So, okay, hey, how safe is this, right? So AAA is the top. So for the U.S., they moved it down from AAA to AA+, plus, I believe, which really isn't that big of a deal, but it does technically mean it's more risky, so it allows uh, lenders to charge more because they're, it's all risk-based pricing. Even the Treasury was like, hey, I think this is arbitrary, and I, I tend to agree with them, not that they were waiting for my approval on this. But, but the agency came out and basically said it's more to do with how we as a country, whichever side you land on, handle you know this debt ceiling crisis. It's always used as a negotiating tool. It's always taken down the wire, you know that that type of thing, which it is more so you know behavioral than actual risk. But either way, that's what happened last week. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I don't think it really changes much of anything, except unfortunately, it could potentially make things even more expensive, you know, financing wise in a rising interest rate environment. So now we come to this week. Another credit rating agency. This time we have Moody's. Uh, they are taking a look at a lot of the regional banks. So, you know, you got your power players in banking, Chase Bank of America, Wells Fargo, those guys. Then you have your regional players that are still really big banks, uh, but not, you know, not maybe not so much on the too big to fail list, but we're still talking about billions of dollars in, in assets, right? So a few things. One, they took a look at some of these banks and issued ratings. Number two, they're also coming out of, the banks are also coming off of uh, the Q2 earnings. So based on this, uh, the rating agencies were uh, broke them up into a few different categories so some banks were moved down a rung on the you know the, the rating scale some were put on a watch list and so we'll take a look at those and we'll talk about their quotes as well so here you have it. Um, again, these are just the, the main highlights, right? So downgraded banks of note all moved down one level. So M&T Bank is probably the one you'll know most well. Pinnacle Financial, BOK Financial, Webster Financial. Under review for potential downgrade, New York Bank, uh, Bank of New York Mellon, I should say, U.S. Bancorp, that's U.S. Bank. Uh, State Street, Truist Financial, another big one. Cullen Frost, Bankers and Northern Trust, another big one. A negative outlook for 11 total banks. Um, the highlights include Capital One, Citizens, and Fifth Third. So those are more regional, but they are popular banks. Uh, so the quotes here that we have, again, this is from the Moody's analyst. So U.S. banks continue to contend with interest rate and asset liability management, ALM for short, risk with implications for liquidity, liquidity and capital as the wind down of unconventional monetary uh, policy drains system-wide deposits and higher interest rates depress the value of fixed rates assets. They go on to say, meanwhile, many banks' Q2 results show growing profitability pressures that will reduce their ability to generate internal capital. This comes as mild U.S. recession is in the horizon for early 2024. And asset quality looks set to decline from solid but unstable levels with particular risk in some banks' commercial real estate portfolio. I don't know why people have to talk like that. No one actually talks like that. What does that mean? It's kind of sort of back to the First Republic or, or Silicon Valley Bank deal where it's like, hey, a number of things. So again, if you're buying, uh, we'll use bonds, for example. If you're buying bonds at, at a fixed rate and you know they were paying basically paid off that interest rate they were written at, well, the rates go up, these bonds. If you go to sell these bonds, they are worth of less, which it, it could be fine because if you're holding the bonds, you're still going to get you know your money until maturity, so you don't have to sell them. Unless people come and ask for their money back, which people have every right to do, then you need to sell some assets. 
free up some capital and these bonds are worth less people will buy them just for less uh you know then you know the whole quantitative easing where basically the, the fed was just buying stuff off of banks balance sheets to create capital because they can't give banks money directly well that's gone away so they do have another special lending policy out there i believe but um that's what kind of what they're talking about so if i can't if i don't have enough money to lend out or i'm concerned about my capital then i might not write as many loans and if you're a bank the way you make loans is to be right or maybe may, may, the way you make money is by writing loans or deposits, right? The other piece was about, you know, commercial real estate as we do this whole work from home thing and people fight going back to the office. These office buildings are worth a lot less. Uh, so, you know, overall, I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense. I said before, I, I tend to debate this with some of you guys in the comments. I still think it's probably fine as long as like, we all probably keep a level head and don't run on the bank, which is funny because that's the name of the la the second channel, run on the bank, then it'll probably be fine and work itself out. I would imagine you might see some more consolidations. Hopefully we see some more promotional offers where they want a lot more, just an easy way to bring in capital again for the second channel and the, the, the channel blog. Uh, that would be nice. We saw at the beginning of the year, maybe four or five banks actually offer offers like that, where there's a large amount of capital but I, I still believe that was more about lending money out than just getting capital in hand. Even on this list, only Capital One is the only bank of note here that, that was asked that, that had an offer like that. So I still bank with Ally. They were, you know, on the list, I think, Capital One. I, I'm not going to move any money anytime soon, personally, but we'll keep an eye on it for sure because it is interesting. Now, on to something more interesting that I actually hadn't thought about is who runs all the loyalty programs from the travel partners out there? Well, it's actually one major company, and they're called called points, which is probably a good name to pick, it's named exactly what you are. Well, points actually uh, partnered with a cyber research security firm to go through and figure out where their vulnerabilities were at in their systems. Uh, so they found they found a few things to say the least, but luckily this was proactive, so uh, nothing has happened yet, and they were able to fix this. But this is coming to us from Wired now. Um, again, the, the, so they didn't name the research firm, but they actually went through worked with the company. So we'll just go through some quotes here. So um, the quotes for the researchers here, the surprise for me was related in the fact that there is a central entity for loyalty and point systems, which almost every big brand in the world uses. Um, so for this point, it, for, from this point, pun intended, it was clear to me that finding flaws in this system would have a cascading effect to every company utilizing the loyalty um, back end. So if they, you know, these guys had broken in and found something, they could jump from Hyatt to Hilton to United on and on and on. And the good news here, again, if you look at from the rep at points, so there was no evidence of malicious uh, malice or misuse of the information and all data accessed by the group has been destroyed. Of course, they're going to say that. Um, but as with any responsible disclosure upon learning of the vulnerability, points acted immediately. Got to put that word in there to address and remediate uh, the reported issue. So overall, what they're saying is, hey, we found some issues uh, and we fixed them and the research firm signed off on them, which is great news because, you know, we don't hear too much about people being proactive. Now, again, this is coming to us from Wired. Uh, you do have to read through. I'll, it's on profitable content, which is always linked for you down below. You do have to read through it a little bit because initially it sounds like something terrible happened. But no, points was being proactive. So it's good there to know your loyalty points are just a little bit safer today. And uh, overall, it is interesting. Maybe we'll do a separate video on just looking at this company. If anyone's interested in that, let me know. Because I never really thought about who actually runs all the loyalty programs. And as you can see from their site, they do manage most of the, the major programs, especially in the travel space. Uh, so that is interesting and uh, good for points to uh, be proactive there. Now, big rumor, and we do have to put a rumor mark by this of the week, is that Delta and American Express, talking about travel programs, were going to start restricting access to the Delta Sky Club. Now, if you remember, maybe two months ago, give or take, uh, could have been longer, Delta went through and they revamped and met their general membership to the Delta Sky Club, uh, making making it more expensive, and then also putting you know a priority on you know their Delta One, um, their top medallion folks even the ticket that you buy, um, likely trying to help with that overcrowding piece. Well, now the Delta and American Express partnership is must be up for review because we at least have a rumor and a rumor from Reddit. Now, I wasn't really going to post on this, but if you read, you know, the Deal Guru site, you know, at least this this leaker, I guess you'd call it, uh, has some some level of track record uh, with, with, with these Amex stories. So it's worth talking about, but again, rumor nonetheless. So the proposed changes 
would be to, again, the main three cards would be the Delta Reserve. That would go down to 10 passes per year for the primary card holder. Authorized users could enter the lounge, but it's going to come from that 10 passes, so 10 passes total. Um, if you wanted unrestricted access, you're going to spend 75 k on the card, which is not uncommon from what I believe they did in the Platinum to maintain guest passes uh, for Centurion Club. Um, now, MX Platinum would go down to six passes per year, and the Delta Platinum, which hardly counts, would be limited to 10 passes a year, of course, by paying $50. Now, you still on the Delta Platinum have to pay $50 to get in, so it's hardly a perk in my opinion, but considering you can't buy guest passes at all, I guess they're billing it as a perk. Now, again, just a rumor, but if we talk this through as if they were actually going to do it, uh, this would be dramatically poor timing, given last week we talked about Capital One finally getting ready to open more lounges in competing airports. We talked about Chase also getting ready to open some more lounges as well, or at least we want them to, I, I should say. Um, you know, so the lounge wars are getting getting good, I guess, depending on where you're at. And I do think these, a lot of these lounges are going to play a big part in people's decisions on which card because the majority of people are not going to get both cards or multiple travel cards right you're going to get one venture x has the the win of being the most affordable and the easiest to use Sapphire Reserve, probably the most well-known and most popular, uh, given how big a brand Chase is, but American Express, quote, the most luxurious, I would say, is probably the perception, and Delta Sky Club, which is probably a bigger selling point, even more so than the Centurion Lounge. There are not really that many Centurion Lounges versus Sky Clubs, um, and, you know, most people would land on that because also Delta is a transfer partner, so it works. So if this were the case, I feel like it's not it's going to be a really big deal to some people for sure. You're, you're, you know, your road warriors, your people who fly constantly, but there's that next tier of people who use the lounge because you have access and you almost feel like you need to go eat some food, grab a sandwich just to keep getting your value from it. But you know, you'd also be fine without it. The pro that you'd be fine, but even then the, the mental barrier of like, Hey, I pay $700 for this car. The Delta Sky Clubs are one of the marquee benefits. And now I, I went to six passes a year. On top of you know having to spend the seventy five grand a year to keep my guest access for Centurion lounges like that, that's a really hard sell. So I I can't imagine American Express wants this. I would assume American Express was dominating that relationship. Is a lot of these airline partners end up making their money selling miles to uh, the credit card companies. Uh, but maybe the overcrowding has just gotten too much to manage, uh, so they've, they've decided to do this. I just think they need, they would need to do something better. I've always said if you you need to probably offer people the option, uh, so maybe you take six passes a year or you take a two hundred dollar airline credit with Delta, but it works for airline tickets, or maybe you make it a hundred dollars even. That way you can see a decent impact to your. I mean, here's what you probably do: you probably combine the value of it, right? So you the card. So you say Amex Platinum Delta. Delta Reserve. I'm going to get rid of the Delta Platinum. You give them a choice. You get six passes plus your $100 credit, and then you have the option to buy more passes if you want, I guess for $50, or you can just keep the unlimited access. Uh, it's probably a little bit more complicated than they want to get. I feel like that would be the best way you'd feel like a win. The Delta Reserve seems even harder because, I mean, that's their core. That's their flagship card for Delta. So to limit that one also seems pretty tough, honestly. So I don't think this is a good look. I, I, you know, again, I always say this is like a, a, a problem that they created. They made all their money selling access to the Sky Club and all these other lounges are just as guilty. And now they need to do something to fix it. But it always seems to be coming at devaluation and hurting the customer. So I think this would be really bad uh, look if they did this. I, I could see it happening though. I just don't. I mean, now I don't think American Express can let it happen. I really don't. I think they're gonna have to step in and try to try to fix this, try to find a better solution. Again, given all the points we talked about on the other cards, I I don't think that's. I also someone wrote in once and had an idea like, why don't you just put like a a grab and go spot out there in the lounge where people can just come get their snacks and drinks or something because that's all a lot of people want anyway so they can just feel like they're winning without doing the overcrowding that could be something to look at as well having those pop-up spots in addition to the lounge maybe i don't know but let me know uh, your thoughts down below if you are an amex card holder if you visit the sky club often love to hear your thoughts on that of course as well as the rest of the stories as well and what else have you seen going on out there in the news as of late 
Anyways, guys, that has been the news for this week and the week that was. So, of course, if you liked it, thumbs up down below. We would appreciate it. If you find it particularly interesting, consider subscribing to the channel because we're posting content just like this every single week. Of course, we're right back here every Sunday with all the news you can use in the week that was in credit and finance. And, of course, every single day over on ProfitableContent.com where we have the latest news stories like this. We have bank promotions, provided they haven't gone under yet. And we have credit card offers. If you're mad about Delta, well, check out Aeroplan. I think they've got a 100K offer going, and we have a link for it. Wouldn't you know it? Anyways, guys, that's going to do it for this one. As always, thank you so much for watching. I'll talk to you very soon this week.